Okay, we're good. We're back, it's Office Hours Live. Let's hear the applause. Yeah. Actually, you have to ask for applause, it's pretty pathetic. Uh, we're live, you're live, I'm alive. Uh, this is uh, live, this is very rare in, you know, in history. That you have a live on Facebook, live. And uh, we have Dolly Parton, who is not alive right now, singing, but it's nine to five. And Dolly, if you are watching, I just want to put in a plug. I really would like, you're on my bucket list to meet. So, and we haven't met. And you know, if you just on the telephone, it could be a, a call. I would feel, I mean, if you came by, if you came into my office hours, can you imagine, can you imagine the, the, the great event we could have? But I have to now. Uh, anyway, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for Dolly Parton, and she is not... She hasn't called. Uh, but, but, uh, welcome to all of you, uh, even if Dolly doesn't call. Uh, call. I, I want to just, I want to talk first of all about, about politics, a lot of stuff to cover. This is a big week, uh, just to keep you up to date, as I always try to do, here's the Republican race. Uh, we see Donald Trump with 844 out of 1237. He's moving very fast. New York was a big win. Ted Cruz is moving also, but he was trenched in New York. And uh, we have uh, Rubio's really going nowhere. That's really, a, that's a dead horse. And then we have uh, Kasich, who is actually did second, came in second in New York. Uh, it's still very far behind. The only way that he has any chance at all is if there is a brokered convention. And the Republican establishment wants a brokered convention. They are trying to stop this guy. And the only way they can have a brokered convention is if this guy doesn't get the 1,237 that Trump needs. The drumpf, the drumpf is probably going to Cleveland. Cleveland, the drumpf. Uh, you know, people say I shouldn't call him the drumpf. I mean, John Oliver called him the drumpf. Uh, because that was his original family name, but uh, people say it's disrespectful. And I understand that, and I, I want to be respectful because the drumpf has been so respectful to women uh, and to uh, Hispanics and to Latinos and to Mexicans, uh, to immigrants, and the drumpf has been so respectful to African Americans and everybody who looks different from the drumpf. Anybody who's not a drumpf, the drumpf is so respectful that we should be respectful to the drumpf. So, drumpf, I'm going to call you Trump. All right, here are the Democrats. Democrats, uh, we have a different story. We have uh, uh, Hillary Clinton uh, with uh, 1,446 pledge delegates uh, and 502 super delegates out of 2,383. Uh, and we have Bernie Sanders, uh, 1,200 pledge delegates and a little smattering of super delegates. Uh, and obviously, New York State this week, this Tuesday, was a defeat. For Bernie Sanders, but it wasn't a surprising defeat uh, because Hillary Clinton had, that's her state. Uh, she lives there and her husband, Bill Clinton, and they live in Chappaqua, New York. Have you ever been to Chappaqua, New York? Well, you should try it sometime. Uh, it's a little bit upstate, but uh, they, that's, that's where they live and she was senator from New York and it's not surprising uh, that she won. And uh, people who are surprised, I, I don't know why they're surprised, but uh, nevertheless, and I don't want to, you know, when I talk about voter suppression, and when I talk about voter suppression with regard to New York, some people say sour grapes, because I am a Bernie supporter, uh, and there are reasons to be a little bit concerned about, tend, people when they talk about sour, uh, sour grapes, when they talk about voter suppression, they tend very often uh, to think about voter suppression in the South, in Southern states that have a, a, a tradition of voter suppression. Or after the Voting Rights Act was gutted by the Republican Congress, 
uh, a lot of people uh, think of the southern states as basically reverting to the voter suppression uh, that they had going before the Voting Rights Act was gutted by Congress. Uh, but there are some voter suppression issues in even lovely New York State. You know, I, would, I, would, I grew up in New York State, uh, in a little town not far from Chappaqua. Uh, my little town was called South Salem, New York, and I went to public school, Lewisboro Public School. There were just a few of, I mean, there were, we were, it was a farm, it was basically a rural area. It was a farm area. My kid, my friends were most, basically, most of them in those days, they lived on farms. And I'd go over to their homes and we'd, you know, do things like milk cows. Now, I don't think Bill and Hillary do that in Chappaqua. It's no longer a farm area. It's now much more upscale. But look at 125,000 people were removed from the rolls by the Board of Elections in New York. They're in Brooklyn, most of them. Why did that happen? We haven't got it. We have not got yet a, an answer. The Board of Election, uh, well, the first thing they said is uh, it was a bureaucratic foul-up. And then yesterday, uh, the head of the Board of Elections said, uh, oh, no, no, nobody was disenfranchised. Nobody was disenfranchised? 125,000 people? Please. Of course they were. And until we get a clear story, there's going to be more and more hard feelings and suspicions that, in fact, this is a rigged game. I mean, there are already a lot of concerns about rigging because you have a closed primary. I'm going to get to closed primary in, in a moment. Just let me say for this point that a closed primary means that all of the independents, and there are many more independent voters, particularly for Bernie Sanders, uh, than there are anybody else, uh, well, independents could not vote and cannot vote in closed primaries. And again, I want to talk about that in a minute, but also you've got uh, no same-day registration in New York State. Which means that even if you caught on to the fact that you are an independent or you're not vote yet voted, uh, you're not yet registered Democrat, and you wanted to register to be a Democrat uh, two weeks before or three weeks before the uh, the actual election Tuesday, you could not have done that. So obviously, uh, there is some issue about voter suppression. It's not just New York State, and it's not just the South. It's Arizona, you remember, and Wisconsin, and voter ideas, ideas and all kinds of things. Uh, and uh, let me just say, pause for a second here, in terms of public policy. We need national voting standards, minimum voting standards in every state. It's ridiculous that different states have different standards. We're part of the same country. Citizenship should mean citizenship, and voting is not a privilege. Voting is a right. Why don't we have a uniform minimum standards with regard to voting rights? So we have same-day registration, for example. Uh, but the reason I'm holding this is that I, 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 just this morning, I put up a little, I, I posted something about this, and 2,040 of you uh, wrote back, and you said things, and I, I, you know, I just talked about the voting issues in New York State. I didn't even say anything about Hillary or Bernie. I just said that there are obviously voting issues in the Board of, board of uh, Elections. I just mentioned that point. And Kathleen Ann, you said, Hillary won't get my vote, my vote if she gets the nomination. If Trump becomes president, I blame the Democratic National Committee for fucking up this election. Excuse me, I had to use your words. Uh, and uh, P.J. Ne Neely, you say, I think it only adds to the growing numbers of Bernie or bust due to the perceived fraud that is going on across voting elections in this country. And Kevin uh, and Penny Barrett, uh, you say, uh, there should be a federal standard that's followed by every state in the union, no more this in state A and that in state B. And I, that's exactly what I said. Uh, Will Schoenhardt, there's so much suspicion surrounding the New York primary and states all over the U.S., Iowa, Nevada, Massachusetts. The center of all of it is always Hillary Clinton. How are we supposed to support the candidate that is robbing our votes and hijacking this election? I understand Republicans are bad, but we seek justice for Bernie Sanders. Joe Marie Novelli, uh, the, if the D Democratic National Committee wants me to stay home in April, then I will stay home in November as well. They have to learn their lesson. If it's at the expense of a Trump presidency for four years, so be it. This is unacceptable, and we must, must fight back. 
Voting for Hillary justifies their cheating. It gives them what they set out to accomplish by voting to silence voters. It won't be tolerated, Joe Marie, you say. And there are a lot of others of you. There is a lot of anger out there about what's going on. Uh, and the closed, the, the, the business of being, uh, of having closed primaries, this is not new, but it becomes very visible and obvious when you have not only a close race, but you have one uh, person, one candidate who is trying to open up the process and takes an anti-establishment populist approach, and the other candidate who appears at least to be the establishment, the insider. And so when you've got these closed kinds of primaries where no independents are allowed to vote, you get this kind of reaction. Uh, and of the next primaries, of the next five primaries, next week, next Tuesday, four of them are closed to independents. Uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, those are all closed. Next Tuesday, like New York. And let me show you something, because this, this people are not really getting this. Uh, so in 2008, we had about 35% of voters who said they were independent and were registered independent. Uh, but look at this line. By 2016, 42% of voters are now registered as independent. A, a substantial increase. And what has happened to the two major parties during that interval over the last eight years? Yes, right. Well, Republicans, we're now down to 26% of Republicans who are registered as independent. And look at the decline of Democrats, down to 29% of Democrats who are registered, not as independent, who are registered Democrats, voters who are registered Democrats. Do you get my point? These, this closed primary system is becoming more and more obsolete. And we are begging for uh, voters who are even more cynical. Now, I know that technically uh, each party as a club can make up its own rules, but you know that's baloney. We've got two parties in this country. It's a winner-take-all system. That's why we have two parties. That's why it's so very difficult to get any kind of third party going. Which brings me to Bernie. Bernie Sanders. Now, some of you Bernie supporters, you're, you're, you're getting... You're getting discouraged, I understand it. And I even heard, somebody called me this morning, an old friend who said he's supporting Hillary, uh, and that I should, he had the effrontery to ask me to call Bernie Sanders and ask Bernie Sanders to drop out of the race. And you know what I said to him? <laughs> that's what I said back to him. That's in my very articulate way. I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, first of all, Bernie has won 15 states already, many with very, very large margins. Uh, he's, uh, his, his, his contributions are actually exceeding. His campaign contributions per month for the last three months have exceeded Hillary Clinton's campaign contributions, and they're on the basis of $27, $27 on average each contribution. He's not going the big money, the big pack way. Uh, and he uh, has huge enthusiasm. I haven't seen this kind of enthusiasm uh, since the late 60s. Now, Obama had a lot of enthusiasm, but I'm talking about movement enthusiasm. In the late 60s, 1968, we had anti-Vietnam War. We had uh, Eugene uh, McCarthy. I, was, I went clean for Gene. I, I went around America. Uh, I, I shaved off my beard. I, I looked, people looked at my face without a beard. People who were friends of mine, and they said, get that beard on as fast as you can, because that jaw is really ugly. Thank you. I say I thank them. But I went clean for Gene. I went around 17 states. I organized young people for Gene McCarthy. That was a movement election. Bobby Kennedy became part of that movement election to end the war. I haven't seen that kind of excitement, that enthusiasm, since Bernie Sanders came in. And it is not because of Bernie Sanders' good looks or wit. Well, he's witty, but it's not because of his wit. It's not because of his humor and his, uh, his lovely countenance and his charm. Uh, it's because of his message. Bernie Sanders is providing Americans with the truth. And that is that the concentration, the increasing concentration of income and wealth and political power at the top threatens not only our democracy, but also our economy. And we can't go on this way. 
That's why his contributions are coming from small contributors. That's why that is so important. That's why it's a problem. You know, when George Clooney, uh, this week, George Clooney and his wife, I like George Clooney. Do you like George Clooney as an actor? I do. I, I, Ocean's uh, 27, 38, 100, so well. I go to all, the, all of those. I like George Clooney. I don't, you know, I'm not in love with George Clooney. I like him. I think he's a, he's a good actor, and I like, and he's funny. But George Clooney and his wife uh, held two fundraisers uh, this week for Hillary uh, Clinton, and uh, in order to go to the fundraiser, uh, to buy a, a place at the fundraiser, to sit at the fundraiser, you had to pay, and Hillary Clinton was there, George Clooney and his wife was there, you had to pay uh, over $350,000. <laughs> Think of, I mean, Bernie Sanders is getting by a $27 contributions on average in order to, to sit down with George Clooney and his wife and Hillary Clinton, you had to pay over $350,000. And now when he was asked about this on uh, network television, George Clooney said, this is obscene. I agree with Bernie Sanders. This is obscene. Well, George, I, I don't want to be disrespectful. I, I do like your movies. But George, if you think it's obscene, why did you do it? George? Okay, uh, just an example of what's going on in this election. Tuesday morning, uh, before the New York primary, I, I posted on my Facebook page, on this page that you're looking at right now, I posted uh, something that I thought was pretty well, not innocuous, but I thought that it was it was it needed to be said. I simply I simply said the the level of of criticism coming from Hillary's supporters toward Bernie and from Bernie's supporters toward Hillary is just getting out of control. That we're going to have to get together eventually if we want to defeat uh, Donald Trump or Ted Cruz. And I don't want to, uh, us to be so angry with each other that we jeopardize that joint effort through our divisiveness. Now, I don't, is this, was this, was this controversial? Does that sound to you to be controversial? Well, I got 19,142 responses. And most of the responses were like this. This is from Lucintha, Lucynthia Keen. Lucynthia, you wrote, this post honestly has me feeling very disappointed in you. That's me. Well, Lucynthia, why are you disappointed in me? Because I said, uh, stop this uh, sort of angry, antagonistic uh, talk between, you know, toward the other, toward the, op toward the opposition. Or here's one from Patricia Clerk. Uh, she said, I think this post might just be your, that means she's talking about me, attempt at trying to get back on the Clinton's good side to get a job in the administration, or at least to try to avoid being blackballed. I'm quickly losing my respect for you, Mr. Reich. Patricia, I'm losing my respect for you too. I mean, all I said was let's tone down the criticism uh, of each group. That is, the Hillary supporters have been criticizing Bernie, and the Bernie supporters have been criticizing Hillary. So why are you angry? And, and I'm not courting. Are you, are you getting blackballed? I was blackballed years ago. I've, I have, I mean, not blackballed, but I've burned a lot of bridges in my time. You know, I've been around for a while. And you burn bridges if you stick up for your principles, don't you? Of course you do. And that's why I want you to continue to stick up for your principles. Uh, Paris Sanders, she says, I agree with you on many levels, but I'm somewhat confused with your recent change in tone. Why are you more neutral now? I'm not more neutral. You mean just simply asking people to tone down criticism among Democrats is neutral? And then uh, we have, I have 10 pages here, I don't want to bore you, but... Uh, of the 19,000, and I had one of my minions of assistants, I only have one assistant, um, look at these, and it turns out that of that 19,000 responses, uh, over 11,000 responses said, uh, I am not going to vote for Hillary Clinton 
at all, ever, even if it means that Trump is going to be elected, and I am never going to join together with Hillary Clinton forces. This makes no sense to me. I understand that you may feel upset right now, but you really want Donald Trump, the drumpf, as your president? A bigot? A misanthrope? A misogynist? Uh, oh, your questions. All right, I was getting, I was getting worked up. Uh, okay, uh, share so other people can join our. Oh yes, will you please share, share? I thought it was, uh, it was share like C H E R, who I'll get to maybe later. Uh, share this, uh, please. This what we're doing right here. Uh, this live broadcast, broadcast. This live whatever it is, um, so that other people can know that. But it's, we're, we're halfway done. We're almost done. It's too late to share. It's not too late. It's never, never too late. My, oh, my mother always told me, it's never too late to learn to share. So do share. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Madeline Jefferson, Elizabeth Warren just introduced legislation to simplify tax filing. Are you in favor? Uh, well, if you're talking about the legislation that Elizabeth Warren put in, that would basically, see, the, uh, the IRS gets all your information about, you know, your W-2s, what you owe, how much you income you have, uh, you, your 1099s, any income that is from outside sources, uh, even from banks, uh, 1099 on your savings. The IRS gets it all, gets copies of all of this. So what happens in most other countries that have the same kind of system is they, those governments, actually take all that information and then give citizens a kind of pre already filled out their tax forms for them. It's it's just a it's easy. It's just a computerized thing. Uh, the IRS could do this. They could do it. I mean, they could just do it automatically. Uh, and uh, seventy percent of Americans don't itemize. So you could just get back. And this is what Elizabeth Warren's bill is about. Uh, the IRS should do this. You just get back the you know your tax form, and if you want to. You sign your name, and if you approve it, you sign your name, and you you put it in. Uh, you know, 54% of Americans uh, are upset about paying taxes, but not because they have to pay taxes. They're upset because of the time it takes. And also, uh, a lot of people have to pay tax preparers, you know, a couple hundred dollars just to, just to accumulate and, and add up and make sure and check the addition. Why should we do this? Elizabeth Warren is right. Next question. Uh, Joseph Dore, thank you for persevering through the bullshit and sticking to your guns. It truly shows and means a ton. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. It, I'll, I'll do that. I've, I can't do any different. All right. Dan Holloway, explain to me the reason investors think cutting jobs is good for a company, but giving out huge bonuses is not a problem. Uh, Dan, it's all because uh, since the 1980s, uh, public companies, big publicly held companies, have bought this baloney argument uh, that the purpose of the corporation is to maximize shareholder returns. Before that, uh, big corporations understood they had responsibilities to their employees and their communities as well. But it was those unfriendly takeovers of the 1980s that really changed the entire culture and understanding of big corporations. Dave Vanderford. Uh, Robert Reich, why not get rid of our current tax system of federal, state, and local taxes and move to a value-added tax, as in Europe, for individuals? One tax rate, everybody pays the same. The more you make, uh, the more you pay in taxes. Uh, Dave, that's a dumb idea. Uh, I'll tell you why. Uh, because it's like the it's like the you know the flat tax that Cruz is trying to sell. It it would take a bigger bite out of the paychecks of. Uh, lower income people than it does out of the paychecks of wealthier people. Even Adam Smith, whose book is some, somewhere, I keep Adam Smith uh, as close as I can in hand, even Adam Smith said that when you, when you have a tax system, you want equal pain. Equal pain means a bigger chunk out of the paychecks or incomes of people who are wealthier. Uh, not to show you lack of respect, it was a good question and I appreciate it. Uh, Michael Larson, question, Mr. Reich, why won't government invest more in education, infrastructure, and affordable access to education? Wouldn't you agree that our nation's greatest economic advantage is the ingenuity that comes as a result of education? Absolutely. Uh, and one of the 
pervasive mythologies created by conservatives is that all government spending is the same. Government spending that's actually investment in the future, education, infrastructure that builds up future productivity is very different from every other kind of government spending and we shouldn't be limited by budget constraints if the return on that kind of public investment is greater than the investment itself in terms of future productivity. Uh, John Reed, I'm concerned that we have lost our fundamental system of checks and balances provided for by our Constitution. Can anything be done to revive it? Uh, John, I don't know exactly what you are referring to. I mean, we do have a president. Uh, that president, uh, some conservatives say, uh, President Obama, by executive orders, uh, uh, you know, has, has, has usurped Congress. Uh, but other people think that Congress, by and particularly the Republicans in Congress, by by saying no to everything and not even acting on uh, a president's nominee to the Supreme Court, uh, they are usurping their powers, powers that should belong to the president. Uh, and some people believe that the third branch of government, uh, that's supposedly the least dangerous branch, and that is the Supreme Court, has usurped its powers by being an activist court. And I don't mean activist uh, in the liberal direction, I mean activist in the conservative direction, and that's what we have now. So, yes, I mean, you could make a case that every branch has made a little bit of, 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 of pushback against the other branches, but that's because we have uh, other branches who are doing the same thing, that are doing the same thing. Beth Ferguson, Beth, with United Healthcare dropping out of the exchanges, you're talking about the Affordable Care Act exchanges, due to the other loss of income, do you see other companies following suit? Uh, well, Beth, it may be, uh, and the big problem here is that you have more and more consolidation of big health insurance companies, uh, and with that consolidation comes a lot of power. Uh, and as they consolidate, they have political power as well. And, and United Health Care has a great deal of power, and it probably figures that even though it may lose business in the short term by not being on the health exchanges, it's going to pressure uh, the administration or the next administration uh, to get even better uh, returns and reimbursements for health insurers. Uh, that's what this game is about. So the fundamental issue here is making sure that if we have to rely on private health insurers that they stay competitive and that there are enough of them and that they are uh, not taking advantage of the system. Greg Sibley, why should we support the nominee if the elections were compromised? Uh, well, Greg, you know, one of the things that we have got to do in this country and one of the most important aspects of the Bernie Sanders movement, and I want to talk about it as a movement, it's not just a candidacy, it's also a movement, uh, is to make sure that our system of voting and campaign funding and our entire election system uh, reflects the will of the people instead of the will of the establishment and the richest uh, and biggest parts of the establishment, big corporations, Wall Street, and so forth. That's what this is all about. Uh, so you have a choice. You can either stay in the movement, do whatever you can, and keep fighting, uh, or you can be, what, cynical, drop out, that's what the establishment, that's what the big money wants you to do. They want you to get so cynical, you and millions of others drop out, because then they can have it all. Next question. Uh, Ali Cornett, what year were you, what year were you born? Alice, oh Alice, Alice Cornett, that is a very, very personal question. If I asked you what year were you born in, would you tell me? Well, maybe you wouldn't. I was born in 1946. And that was a year when uh, Bill Clinton was born, and George W. Bush was born in 1946, and Ken Starr, do you remember Ken Starr? He was born in 1946. Uh, Donald Trump was born in 1946. Cher was born in 1946. Uh, Anybody who's anybody was born in 1946. And you know why we were all born in 1946? Demographers think this is a very complicated... Why was the baby boom? Why, why did the baby boom start in 1946? And they scratch their heads and they write their papers. It's not that complicated. It's not rocket science. My father was in the Second World War. He came home. There was my mother. You see? All right, uh, Tony Martos, do you think if Hillary indeed does win the nomination, she would consider Bernie as a running mate? 
Well, interesting question, uh, Tony. Either Bernie or maybe Elizabeth Warren as a, a running mate. I think that it would be very wise uh, for Hillary to do that because you've got so many people, uh, as evidenced by my tiny little sample, and granted it's a skewed sample because there's some uh, self-selection bias to it, uh, but uh, of the 19,000 people that responded to my, what I thought was a pretty sensible suggestion, uh, a huge number, the vast majority, said they would never vote for Hillary. So if you have that feeling out there, obviously if Hillary is the nominee, and she may not be, uh, Bernie may be the nominee, and the question might be, should Bernie take Hillary as his uh, vice president? Uh, but I think it is important for the Democrats to get together. I do. Steve Boyd, Professor Reich, can Bernie run as an independent, or are these establishment rules that are there establishment rules that will not allow him? Uh, Steve, he can Bernie uh, can run as an independent. Uh, or a third party, if he loses the nomination. Uh, now, it may be hard to get on some state ballots. That's true, because there are some states. This goes back to the thing we've been talking about this whole half hour, and that is n minimum national standards. Uh, but the real problem with running as a third party independent is that you tend to draw votes away from the party that is closest to you ideologically. Uh, now, we saw that when Ralph Nader ran. Uh, in 2000 and drew some votes away from Al Gore. At least that's the allegation. And Al Gore, as you know, won that election. But I'm moving on. Uh, Tyler Sutherland, I want to run for national office out of Long Island in New York. Do you have any advice for me? Uh, Tyler, we'll just clean up the Voting Act in New York first, or make sure that voting is cleaned up. If you are a good and responsible candidate. I think everybody in New York State uh, should and does have that responsibility. We all have that responsibility. Last question. All right, uh, Fred Cipher, what is your what's your favorite sandwich? That's the last question, Fred. You really want to know? I like tuna salad on pumpernickel. So, if you want to send me. Uh, Please do. I, I just want to, before we wind up, this is important. This is the commercial, but it's an important commercial. It has to do with our Kickstarter uh, documentary. It's a documentary on saving capitalism. We're working on it, uh, and we need your support. This is a nonprofit venture. It is very important. We have a Kickstarter campaign. Go to savingcap.com slash Kickstarter, and please help us. We've got 66% of the way. We've got two weeks to go. Uh, we have 1,902 backers, which is fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. But we've got to get to our goal, or we don't get any money at all. That's the rule of Kickstarter. Uh, so we need you, and we need you for this production. And we need you, just like uh, the, the last film that Jake Kornbluth and I did, uh, Inequality for All. And it, it's in schools, it's in colleges, it's, a lot of people have seen it. Uh, they think that it really is, I think it is an important film in terms of uh, showing what has happened to our economy and why inequality is a huge problem. This next documentary uh, that is Saving Capitalism, based on this book, uh, takes us to the next step. What do we do about all this? What is this movement that Bernie Sanders has uh, helped propel? Where do we go with it? Uh, where is it that the, uh, that the real alliances are going to be made in America? It's an important, I think it's an important set of issues. Um, and uh, there are rewards, there are rewards. The nice thing about Kickstarter is you get rewards. You, you, you pay a certain amount and then you can get drawings, some of my drawings, you can get uh, uh, books and I'll sign them, you can, get, uh, you can get all kinds of things. You can go to a screening, you can get a link to the screening, you can actually go to a screening, I may be there at the screening, I'll meet you in person, I'll take you out for a drink, I'll take, take you out for lunch, I'll take you out for dinner, I'll, I'll you know, I'll do whatever, well, not whatever you want, I'll do within limits. All right, so please, please help us. That's the end of this week's show. I want to, I want to, I want to, whoops, where are you, Dolly? Oh, Dolly. <laughs> I've got to get Dolly back. I want to, <laughs> you know, see, this is an amateur hour. It's an amateur half hour. I want to thank Zoe Beck, Zoe Umlaut Beck, and Yael uh, Bridge, 
uh, for their extraordinary help and support. And I want to thank you, and I'll see you next week. Wait a minute. Do you have to push the check? No, I don't know. It's just frozen.